Okay, uh, we're here at the Dice Summit. We're joined by Paul, uh, CEO of Splash Dynamics. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Thank you. Look, I wasn't too sure. We're doing a handshake. We'll, yeah, do, a handshake. Like we'll, we'll do a handshake. Um, can we just sort of like touch upon briefly uh, the, the subject matter for your, your talk today? Sure. Well, uh, um, when I, uh, the guys from Dice got in touch with me mm. and, uh, and said they'd love for me to speak at Dice London, of course, I was overjoyed because so many of my, you know, of my heroes have taken yeah. the dice stage. You know, people like Gabe Newell and J.J. Abrams have been on the dice stage this year. And then, of course, they said they wanted me to talk about my mistakes, which made <laughs> much more sense. Um, I think in my 12-year career as a CEO, I've made more mistakes than the mm. average person in the games industry. And so I thought it might be cool to just come along and instead of the big product release or sales yeah. pitch or whatever, just to talk a bit about the lessons that we've learned mm -hmm. while running the company and perhaps a small indie team or maybe a, a medium-sized AAA team mm. or maybe one of these big publishing teams might be able to learn something um, that they could use themselves. Yeah, I was going to say that the, 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 the subject of the talk was happiness. Was it happiness through strategy? Or, mm -hmm. Yes, and I just thought that was an interesting <coughs> one given that you guys are renowned for first-person shooters and punching right. people in the face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it, it's very much about the team dynamic. It's about involving that happiness across the structure across the entire team and entire development studio. Yeah, exactly. I think the thing is that, you know, roller coasters are thrilling, but they still make fans of roller coasters mm. happy. So I don't think it's intrinsically about whether we make combat games or whether we were to make games that were, you know, more genial. Yeah. The general idea behind it is that for us as a company, what we've discovered is that the why we make games is almost more important than the what. Mm -hmm. And we've discovered this not because I had some incredible epiphany because I'm capable of amazing original thought, yeah. but just because I read a bunch of books by people that are much smarter than me. Yes. And so all I've really done is kind of codify it into, mm -hmm. a, a, into three simple messages. Well, you said about survival of the team. What I thought was interesting was, was in a way, generating that happiness, but at the same time, having that survival instinct to make things as best as possible. Does that feel like a, a juxtaposition of the two? No, I don't think so. I think that, that really my point about survival is just mm. that when you look at the trend of the past 20 years, there are in some in incredible companies, people like Bioware and Blizzard and mm -hmm. Valve and Epic and id Software, who helped us get our start in the industry. And now in the free-to-play space, people like Nexon that have been around for years too. Mm -hmm. And these companies often have a very clear and specific core purpose that's really easy for us to understand from the outside. And I suppose the point about team survival is, you know, logically, the kind of logic base for the argument is, if a team stays together for longer, and if they get to know each other mm -hmm. better, then they have more trust. Mm. If they have more trust, they engage in much better debates. If they engage in much better debates, then they tend to commit you know, more happily because they really discuss things properly. Mm. If they commit more happily, they're happy to hold each other accountable. And that kind of team tends to generate results. And if those people aren't losing their jobs, they're saving their lifeblood, <laughs> going home and telling their parents or their husband you know, that they can't pay the mortgage, then that stability, that security, it doesn't make them happy. It's not a motivator, but it's one of those kind of things that well, Hertzberg you know, referred to as hygiene factors. You have to fix that stuff first before people can pursue all the other things that make them happy. So the what of what we do is dictated by why and how we do it, not the other way around. And you said about structuring it so you have the right people on the bus before mm -hmm. you decide the bus's direction. It's like a, a sort of chicken egg scenario. Do you, do you feel that that does work, having the right people together, and then you work out collectively where you want to be going? Yeah, I mean, for, for number one, it's much easier to find people uh, that are better than me at my job. <laughs> I think particularly because when you're a founder and an entrepreneur, and you start a company because you're really interested in achieving something mm -hmm. specific, you end up wearing seven hats and you think you're awesome at all of them, mm -hmm. and you're really not. So when you start to hire people who are focused on very specific individual disciplines, like design and art and programming or marketing or HR or finance, those people have spent their entire lives worrying about that single discipline. So it becomes much easier to get the right people on the bus and then talk to them about what they want to do, where they want to take the company, and then take on board all of those really cool ideas. And at some point, I really think you have to make that transition. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's like sort of trust again, factors mm -hmm. into that trust, because you're saying during a talk it's very hard to take your hands off the whole micromanagement thing, but mm -hmm. you just had to learn that through experience. I think through experience, but also through what I've read, there's a, a fantastic white paper by a guy called Churchill, mm. I think it's um, Harvard, 
uh, Business Review, and he has this really simplistic graph. It's plagiarized and stolen by almost every consulting company on the planet. Mm. But it simply says that you know a small to medium-sized business during its initial formation is probably going to have some kind of crisis of delegation as the owner mm. realizes he can't manage people. And then if he overcomes that and doesn't you know, crash and burn, then the people he hires are going to be very officious, but he'll probably have some kind of crisis of bureaucracy. Mm. And if he overcomes that with clever succession planning and proper structure and everything else, he'll probably then have a cash crisis. So you, know, you just have this sequence of things that are coming, and that roadmap is largely the same for every company, no matter how successful they are. You could make all the money in the world and still be completely incapable of delegating to people and not be able to follow it up with a second success. So there's just so much that we can learn from other businesses outside the games industry. And I think often these, sing these, these kind of single, simple ideas, which is why I used Aristotle's rhetoric mm -hmm. in the talk, we don't have to worry about what people are doing this year or next year, or the KPIs or the metrics or all of this detail. People like Aristotle got it right when he just said, look, you just have to be credible, you have to have passion that you can instill in your audience, and you have to have a kind of basic sound logic for your argument. Mm -hmm. It must be sort of a thing, though. You, you still take that a hit from the critical side of things, from critics reviewing the games and mm -hmm. such. I just want to sort of pull upon um, Brink, where we, I mean, we previewed the game, reviewed it, and we talked to you guys so much during that process. You guys were so so passionate about it. Well, what, how does it feel? To sort of like the balance between the amount of energy and love you put into it versus perhaps the, the end result. Not the view of the press. It. Yes. Well, I mean, the thing is, if you think about the games that we've made mm. over the years. Sometimes they've been commercially successful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fans have loved them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the press have loved them. It's rare that we've had all three at the same time. In Brink's case, it sold two and a half million units. Mm -hmm. I think it made in excess of $100 million. So it did pretty well financially. Mm -hmm. But I feel like overall it wasn't our strongest mm -hmm. you know, title. I think what we've learned over the course of the years, though, is that if you don't take risks, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a mathematician called Igor Ansoff, and he came up with this simple idea called an Ansoff matrix. Mm -hmm. And it's really not complicated. If you imagine two dimensions, one is products and one is um, markets, mm -hmm. and then you have existing products, existing markets, existing, uh, and then new products, new markets, when you just play in the space of creating the same stuff for the same audience all of the time, you tend to see that market de decay. It tends to decrease over time. Fans lose interest. People lose interest. Mm. So you try to you know, grow that market to sustain it, and people create new products for that existing market. You know, that's a product development strategy. Mm. And that's what we did when we had Wolfenstein Enemy Territory on the PC, and we brought out Enemy Territory Quake Wars, and that reviewed really well. Number one hit in both countries, 120 awards and nominations. Mm. We were really pleased with it. When we came to do Brink, instead of doing a sing another single adjacency move, producing another game for an existing market, mm -hmm. we did two things at the same time. We tried to create a completely new intellectual property, which we'd never done before, mm -hmm. and we tried to create a game for a console audience, which we'd never done before. So we were creating, in essence, a new product for a new market. And we were doing this as an inexperienced yes. management team. So in essence, we were undertaking what Igor Ansoff would have considered a diversification strategy. Mm. And we were trying to do it seven years into <laughs> running a business when we still couldn't read a balance sheet. Yeah. So of course, we had a great time doing the game and we learned a hell of a lot from it. And I think you know, that in the end, it did okay financially. But you know, it could have been so much better if two or three things had been sorted mm. out right before the end, right before the point it released. If you look back to the events that we ran just prior to releasing, mm. people were still loving it and having fun. You know, it doesn't really matter in the end what happened. I think we had a great relationship with people mm. like Bethesda Marketing, who are amazing at promoting the game. And it's a result of their incredible work that we were number one in the UK, number one in the US, the May we released. Mm. And for everything that the critics said, we were number one in the UK and number one in the US again <laughs> in the month of June with no marketing too. Mm. So I speak to a lot of people, and for them it's Marmite. Perhaps the first half of the people that bought it you know, were frustrated mm. because that patch wasn't out and it didn't fix lag and it didn't fix networking and stuff. And then the second group that, that, that liked it and reviewed it, a lot of people in the UK, like the Times, uh, the Daily Mirror gave it five stars. And once they'd played that kind of post-patch version, they changed their view. So the game as it exists today, I think, is, you know, stands up to be something alongside everything yeah. else that we've done. But I do feel really bad for the people that got it in that first week in that kind of buggy state during its mm -hmm. initial release. Well, is it something, I mean, you guys still have a lot of love for it by the sign, so, I mean, is it something you would, you would like to uh, reapproach with, you <coughs> said, the, these new, you, you've taken that step back post-launch and went, okay, we now know 
A, B and C, let's apply that again. Well, we decided two things. I think that we've demonstrated an ability to be consistently successful when we work with other people's mm. intellectual property. So in the case of the sequels that we made for Wolfenstein, mm. and when we helped out with Doom 3 and with Enemy Territory Quake Wars, they were either commercial hits, they were all fan successes, and some of them were critical successes mm. too. Over the course of those games, we earned 300 plus awards and nominations. In working in Batman Arkham Origins, I'd consider that a single adjacency move too. We're working on something with all of our heart and all of our passion, but while being very respectful of our treatment for that universe. Mm. However, in creating IP from scratch now, we do it by funding it ourselves first. Yes. So in the case of Extraction, which is our new first-person shooter, it's a triple-A first-person shooter. It's cool, people love it, it previewed really well at PAX, but critically, we funded it, it's being given away for free. So we took all of the risks during the first two years of development ourselves. There isn't any sense that we feel we've let a partner down or anything else. At the point, we've now gone into a relationship with Nexon, who are just an amazing partner for that mm. title in North America and Europe. It's really already been through its entire alpha process. It's had 12 months of players playing it in privately, private, uh, 35,000 fan messages in the private forums, and just thousands of bugs found for us. Another thing we learned from that period was we should build our own online services yes. and not rely on other people's. So we launched a new company called Fireteam.net, and we now track everything that happens in every single game. I mean, it's anonymous, it's not based on any kind of personally identifiable information, but the idea behind tracking that information is we can find frame rate problems, we can find network latency problems, we can find imbalances in maps, we can find periods where people get frustrated, and we can fix all of that stuff before the game comes out. And we've been doing that for more than a year now with Extraction, and that process will continue throughout the rest of its launch and beyond. Okay, excellent. Listen, thank you very much indeed for taking oh, the time. I feel like I could be spending <coughs> the rest of the day talking to you. I feel I need to take you to a be uh, pub somewhere and just have a beer. <laughs> listen, for That'd now, be very nice. thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Yeah.